Silverstone was probably one of the most exciting Grand Prix we've had in a while, and I'm here to break down the performance, tire, and strategy data behind the 2022 British Grand Prix. My name is Blake, and welcome to Break F1. Before we get into the race data, let's have a quick look at where everyone is sitting in terms of low fuel pace. For me, this is pretty interesting as it shows us the maximum performance that the teams are able to squeeze out of their cars right now. Now, qualifying was wet, and we know the wet tends to mix up the grid a little bit, but fortunately, FP3 was dry. Now, the unfortunate thing is FP3 is always a little bit of a weird session. We don't know what fuel levels people are running or what engine modes they're running either. Often, it's just a dress rehearsal getting ready for qualifying, and some of the drivers may or may not get it all together. Now, I'm not going to spend too much time on these charts. Feel free to pause the video if you want to dig a little bit deeper into this. This is simply the pace in terms of percent lap time from pole for each of the drivers. The lap time is also shown here to the right of each of the bars. On the left, we've got the FP3 pace rankings. FP3 looked a bit like the usual suspects, with Mercedes a little bit close to the front in terms of single lap pace compared to normal. On the right, we've got the Q3 runs featuring everybody except Latifi, who didn't set a reasonable lap time despite making it into Q3. We can see in Q3, Perez is 0.6% off of pole. Both the Mercedes surprisingly a little bit further off compared to where they were in the dry, but let's not worry about that too much as we had a dry race. It seems like around Silverstone, the Mercedes was a happier car than we had seen in Canada and substantially happier than the porpoising grounding saga of Baku. So let's see what happened in the race. Now, here's the overall qualifying results which set up our grid. Again, you can pause this if you're just catching up, but really the only big shock was Latifi somehow making it into Q3 and the rest of the top 10 were more or less the usual suspects. Now, I'm going to do this weird thing where I talk about the race results first, then we explain how it all happened. Carlos Sainz scores his first pole position and wins his first Formula 1 Grand Prix, but it did not come to him easily. Many people are even thinking this was a gift from Ferrari, but let's see. Perez finishes P2 after a detour to the back of the field after having to pit for a new front wing that was damaged at the race restart. Yep, race restart. There was a massive shunt kicked off after Gasly got pinched between Russell and Joe. Albon, Joe, and Russell did not make it past lap 1, Russell ending his excellent top 5 finishing streak this season. Very disappointing for him. Hamilton has probably one of the best races of the year finishing P3 after some pretty spectacular wheel-to-wheel -wheel racing at the sharp end. Now, I'm not sure if Mercedes are back in the mix for real or if the smooth Silverstone circuit played into their hands this weekend. We've definitely got to dig into Lewis's pace because this looked very impressive. Now, back to the results. I'm going to avoid talking too much about Charles Leclerc right now finishing in fourth because, well, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about that in just a minute. We don't hear too much about Alonso bagging P5, nor Norris coming in P6. Max with damage finishes 7th, barely ahead of Mick Schumacher. We're going to have a quick look at some of the data as well and see what was actually happening with Verstappen's car. And the rest is history, unfortunately, with quite a few DNFs, but that's racing. So here we have what I like to call the race trace. I'm going to keep referring back to this throughout the video to explain what's going on with this race. This graphic highlights the gaps between drivers on each lap. It also shows events such as safety cars and red flags. How quickly a driver is approaching another driver or falling away from another driver indicates their relative pace. These large drops here on the chart indicate a pit stop. After the initial race restart, the race is divided into two chunks. We've got the main body of the race, and then the sprint to the finish after the safety car finishes on lap 42. Now, as far as tire strategy, this was supposed to be a one stop medium to hard. But of course, the safety car at the end changed this for quite a few drivers. I say quite a few drivers because not all drivers at the end of the race pit for new soft tires. I'm looking at one of them in particular. I didn't realize this until later, but Russell actually was the only driver to start on the hard tire. That would have been pretty interesting to see how that played out, having Russell on a different strategy to everyone else. But unfortunately, DNF did not let us see what happened with that strategy. Let's start with the easy stuff first. The Red Bulls. Now, Perez stops here on lap five with a broken front wing and has to go all the way to the back. He fits a medium tire and drives all the way through the end until the final safety car on this single medium. Verstappen is following signs until lap 10 when signs makes a mistake at Beckett's and Max overtakes. Now, something else happens to that, but we'll come back to it. Let's see the difference between the pace of the Red Bull and the Ferrari at the beginning of the race and try to see what's different about their cars. Now, I've taken lap 7 before the DRS was enabled, so we can see what Signs and Verstappen are up to. Verstappen is the pink traces, and Signs are the green traces. Looking at this, the first thing that comes to mind is the Ferrari is running more downforce based on their high-speed apex speeds. You can see that here, here, and here. The Ferrari just with overall more downforce on the car. Then, another telltale sign that Red Bull is running less downforce is simply their straight-line speed. 
Going in here into six, into nine, and into 15, we can see that Verstappen is carrying more straight line speed. Now, through turn one, six, nine, and 15, the Ferrari can carry quite a bit more speed through these corners. So these are your medium to low speed corners, longer combined corners that Ferrari is doing a very good job of. Sainz is finding most of his gap over Verstappen into the long left-hander into turn six, turn 15 in the high speed corner, and then the long low speed corner of turn 16, 17 at the end of the lap. I'll skip over this for now, but later on, the DRS Delta on the Red Bull is still huge. It's like 20 kilometers an hour, but we might look at that later. Now let's go back to the race. Two laps after overtaking signs, Verstappen has an issue going through turn nine. He thinks he has a puncture, so he boxes. Let's imagine this. The car is going through turn nine, and you've got about 30 seconds to figure out what's going on. Engineers are looking at tire pressures, aero loads, and all the characteristics of the suspension data. 30 seconds isn't really a whole lot of time to figure out a whole lot. So as precaution, they pit Max onto another set of mediums in case there actually is a puncture. This is so much better than getting halfway around another lap and having a blowout, damaging the car and probably retiring. After investigating further, they realize the car is mechanically okay, but they have an issue with the diffuser of the car. So they find out that the rear of the car has lost a lot of downforce, but the team had not identified that before they stopped. That means they very likely had way too much aero balance or front wing on the car, making the car very nervous to drive during this stint. This will result in a loss of pace from overall downforce being lost and from poor car balance. This is far from ideal. Going back to the race trace, we can see Max pitting here onto a medium and he has absolutely no pace relative to Perez on a much older medium. Max is falling away from the race leaders here while Perez is just driving through the field. Now, instead of gaps, these are just a plot of the fuel corrected lap times. You can see how much performance Max has lost from the damage to the diffuser here on this stint, going from his first stint here to this stint here. The second medium set is very slow. Later, he stops for a hard and corrects the aero balance, but the pace on this tire is also very poor for Max. Now, if you're wondering where exactly Max is losing time due to a damaged diffuser, let's have a quick look at that. Now, the pink trace is lap 11 before the damage, and the green trace is lap 16 after he pits for new mediums while having the damaged floor. He is nearly 1.5 seconds slower after the damage. Most of the losses are biased towards the high speed sections, except for those that are just about flat. He's not really losing any time through turn one, two here, but he has clearly lost a lot of aerodynamic load as he cannot get the car comfortably through turn nine, turn 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and turn 15 are very slow. Now that's pretty much the end of Verstappen's race. Come to find out, it was a piece of an Alpha Tori bodywork wedged into the floor somewhere. Imagine that. Now it's time for the juicy stuff. Let's go back and focus on the race of the two Ferrari drivers and see what we can understand. My biggest question when I started analyzing this portion of the race was, should Ferrari have let Leclerc through sooner? I'm still not sure, but maybe you can help me decide. Now, after Verstappen was forced to stop early, we are now on a Ferrari battle for one, two. On the radio, we hear Leclerc telling his team, I'm much faster than Carlos, you should let me through but they hold it out and he follows him for nearly 10 laps before signs pits. I think at this point, he probably has quite a bit of pace in hand. He's able to maintain a closer gap to signs than Verstappen could, but still cannot get the overtake done. Now, again, as I said, finally on lap 20 signs pits and Leclerc cannot pull away. He does not appear to have any pace left in hand. Now, I've got a few questions. Did Charles actually have more pace in hand? Honestly, I think so, especially considering for how long he could closely follow, which brings me to my second question. Did being stuck behind signs have a massive impact on his tires? My gut feeling tells me yes, but it's really hard to say right now, which leads me to my final question. Why did Charles not overtake if he had that pace advantage in hand? Was he just trying to follow the rules and play nice? Or was he simply unable to get a move done? Now, it is possible that being so close to signs kept him in the DRS window and helped him pull along without having too much damage. But let's gather some more data and make a more informed decision about what actually happened. Now, on lap 21, signs pits for hards and Leclerc stays out for five more laps and does not get the overcut done. Once Leclerc pits here for hards, he does seem to come alive. It looks like he's driving a completely different car. Five or six laps later, he drives straight through signs. Let's dig a little bit more into this. Now, here are the fuel corrected lap times from lap 21 onwards. We see Leclerc still has good pace on the medium, but when Sainz pits for the hard, he's going quite a bit faster on a slower compound. Now, once Leclerc pits for the hard, he is substantially faster than Sainz. I'm talking like half a second a lap. Leclerc is clearly much happier on this tire, which makes it a bit easier for him to get past. Now, unless Leclerc had very poor balance on his medium tire, 
I feel like he genuinely had a lot more pace than Carlos in hand, but probably following Carlos for so long cooked his tires. Realistically, we knew no more than Ferrari at this point, so it's always hard to tell. But let's just try to see why Leclerc was so much faster than Sainz on this hard tire. Now, this is lap 34 once Leclerc has broken Sainz DRS. Sainz is in pink, Leclerc is in green. Now, the first thing I notice is that Sainz is actually appearing a little bit low on battery. You can see at the end of each of the straights, he's losing quite a bit of straight line speed, and that's usually indicative of a driver recharging, which tells us that Sainz was probably spending a lot of his battery to stay ahead of Leclerc. Now, by lap 37, it looks pretty much the same. He's still recovering battery, and he's still slow in the same spots. Realistically, Leclerc's just faster into the low speed more than anything. You can see here into three, into six, seven, uh, into the final corner, Leclerc's just gaining a lot of lap time everywhere. Without steering or balance data, it's hard to say, but Leclerc looks much more comfortable on the hard tire than Sainz. Now, before we switch gears and talk about the last phase of the race, let's bring up two more drivers back into the mix and see what they've been up to. We've kind of been focusing on the Fry race for now, but Hamilton is well and truly in the mix in terms of position and pace. After Perez boxes for wing damage at the start, Hamilton is flying after he clears him. In clean air, he is outpacing the signs in the Leclerc train at this point. Now, in Canada, the safety car kind of helped Lewis into the podium at the end of the race, but he still had plenty of pace in hand. But here, Lewis is in the podium fight outright without any other racing circumstances helping him out. That's pretty impressive. Let's try and understand a little bit more. Now, here's what that looks like in terms of pace. This is the Claire and Hamilton, and also the color of the dots shows you which tire compound they're on. These are also the fuel corrected lap time, so it takes the fuel load out of the calculation. Now, Hamilton is outpacing the Claire and even signs on the medium tire 20 laps into the stint here. Despite the usual 0.5 to 1% offset that the Mercedes usually have in terms of pace at low fuel, the Mercedes is a rocket ship on Sunday. Now, the next few events will tell us if Mercedes are back in the mix or if this is a track-specific advantage for them. My gut feeling is that Mercedes are getting the car figured out, and just because single-act performance isn't there at the front, that does not mean they can't continue to end up on the podium consistently on merit. Now, if you wanted to understand how fast everyone was in terms of stint pace during the race, here's a quick ranking of the top four teams. You've got driver name, stint number, tire compound. I've even added a new figure to the right of this, which is the number of laps on that stint. Now, the pace metric I'm using is just the average of the fuel corrected pace for that stint. It works pretty well considering we didn't have a whole lot of deg to worry about. Now, Hamilton's stint three on the hard was absolutely insane. Yes, it was only a four lap stint, but he was absolutely flying. Now, feel free to pause this and check it out a bit more if you'd like, but I'm going to get back to the race. We'll start weaving this into the analysis more in the future. Now, at this point in the race, Paris has been on a set of mediums since lap six. He's about 20 seconds behind the race leaders and could really use a miracle if he wants a sniff at the podium. The consistently unreliable Alpine gives him that miracle he was asking for. Now, here's where the race gets interesting. Again, the safety car comes out for Alcon stopping on the start finish line. At this point, the race leader Leclerc is just 30 seconds away from the pit entry. Do they stop or do they stay out? At this point, Leclerc is on 12 lap old hards and Sainz is on 17 lap old hards. Hamilton is right behind them and he pit five laps ago for new hards as well. Perez is P4. 20 seconds behind them, which means any of the top three easily cover with a safety car pit stop. So here's what happens. Leclerc stays out on his used hard and everybody else in the top eight stops for fresh, soft tires. Honestly, this sounds like an absolute disaster for Leclerc. Let's just see what happens and break this down because I think it's even worse. So this is what the final 10 laps of the race look like. Lewis and Checo have a good scrap, which sees them finish P2 and P3. And now here's the sad part. Leclerc goes from leading the race to finishing fourth. He gets absolutely eaten alive on his used hard tires. Unfortunately, it's much worse than the Ferrari thought it might be, and this is why. Now, to put the whole thing in perspective, here are the fuel-corrected lap times for Ferrari for the whole race. Now, look how horrible Leclerc's hard tires are after the safety car restart. He's going over half a second slower than himself before the restart, and compared to signs on new softs, he's losing anywhere between 1.5 to 0.5 seconds a lap. 
after the safety car period, the Claire just can't get these tires working again. Now, I don't think this means his hard tires are particularly worn out. This was meant to be a one-stop medium hard race. Now, usually when the tires are quite worn, they do struggle to maintain temperature and can quickly fall out of the operating range. But it looks like after the safety car, Leclerc just couldn't get these tires working again. To be fair, he's just a bit slower than Sainz was at the end of his hard stint, but compared to the start of his stint, this doesn't make any sense. The only explanation is he just couldn't build any temperature in these tires. Now, I still think Leclerc staying out in the hards was the riskiest strategy they could have had. I mean, we know that now, obviously. Now, taking a step back and looking at it with some hindsight, here's what I see. At the safety car, Perez had to stop. At this point, he had only run mediums. So either way, the leaders were already clear for a safety car stop to Perez. Hamilton was effectively on five lap old tires. He very well could have stayed out, but Hamilton has a free stop to Perez, and there is no way that Hamilton would not stop for a free set of soft tires at this point. Now, if Leclerc pits and Hamilton stays out, Leclerc will have a fresh set of soft tires and try to overtake Hamilton on a five lap old hard. I like those chances. The hard tire should be at least a little bit difficult to warm up. We saw that it was very difficult to warm up fine, but he's got a great chance at overtaking Hamilton if he pits for soft tires. In the end, Leclerc stays out on the hard tire and falls back through the field to finish P4. Hamilton has a fantastic drive all the way up to third, the second podium in a row for Lewis, and Perez has an amazing recovery drive basically from the back of the field all the way to P2. This is clearly a performance deserving of driver of the day. Of course, he was massively saved by the safety car, but that is racing after all. Now, personally, I'm starting to feel bad for Leclerc. On one hand, I'm happy to see Carlos get his first pole position in race win, but on the other hand, I feel like Leclerc was just had over by Ferrari's poor strategy again. Now, the biggest thing in my opinion is that other than qualifying, Leclerc outperformed signs in the race, he had the advantage going into the safety car, and Fry were either too slow to react or just made the wrong call. As I said earlier, if they'd pit Leclerc and Sainz, the only person they might have had to race would be Hamilton, and if he hadn't stopped, he would have been on older hards. I really don't get it at all. Anyway, I hope you guys have enjoyed this video, and if you missed it, I posted a summary of my race reactions for once. I've left a card here for that video. Check it out and let me know what you think, and I'll see you guys in Austria.